two started uh, after Pearl Harbor was bombed, and then it was just natural. Everybody said, "Well, we're going into the service. You know, we're going to be part of uh, this war sooner or later." So everybody's kind of preparing and talking about what what they're going to do, and. Uh, uh, my first thought was I wanted to go into the Navy, so uh, uh, I was in my second year of junior college. Uh, junior college was Lamar, Lamar College down Beaumont, which is now a four-year institution, but back then it was just a two-year. And uh, a uh, sergeant from Ellington Air Force Base and a... Uh, uh, lieutenant came to the school and said, guys, all the schools are now forming ROTC units, and uh, we want Lamar to form one. And uh, so the uh, <clears throat> lieutenant left that sergeant at Lamar, and in the afternoons after classes, we would uh, go out and he would train us uh, on marching and talk about uh, military training and such and uh, so they uh, started picking who was going to be the uh, cadet uh, uh, skipper or uh, whatever I was, I forgot now. <laughs> so I could call cadence real good, had good rhythm part and uh, uh, about every guy at Lamar, joined this ROTC unit. We had uh, all together, I'd say, uh, a couple hundred guys, ROTC unit, and uh, I was picked to be the drill drill officer, I guess, because that's all we needed. So three times a week, we'd get out after school and and do military uh, marching and learn. Uh, the calisthenics, we did calisthenics. And across the, the highway from Lamar Junior College was a wooded, wooded area. And uh, about once a month, uh, some other guys would come in from uh, Ellington Air Force Base, some other military guys, and they'd bring rifles with them and we'd get over there and practice uh, over there in the woods, some military training. And uh, so I joined at the time I joined the Navy V-5 program, which was a pre-flight, uh, pre-naval -avi -avi aviation deal. I got called up to go to boot camp in San Diego, but I still belonged to the V-5 program, which gave me the privilege of picking uh, if I wanted to stay in aviation, some field of aviation. So went to San Diego, I think we were, boot camp was about six months, and uh, they, they asked me, okay, what field do you want to go into? And I said, well, in aviation, uh, I want to go to Pensacola, uh, study aerial photography, because I had an interest in aerial, in, in photography at that time. Uh, got on a train and went from San Diego to uh, uh, Pensacola, Florida, where we started our, uh, Photo, photo training first uh, with all kind of Navy cameras and, and uh, doing darkroom work. We had to learn to develop film and process it and make prints and everything. And then after the first month, no, the first six weeks, we started flying and doing uh, aerial photography. And uh, all together, uh, I was in Pensacola, for almost five months of full training, all, all the aviation training and so photography in, training. In 41? 19, well, no, 42. 42. Uh, and uh, then I went from Pensacola to Washington, D.C. to do some advanced uh, photo uh, interpretation uh, work uh, or training and uh, lithograph. They'd also told us lith lithograph, because back uh, at that time, lithograph was, a, uh, in the military, was a big deal. You know, they did a lot of lithograph. 
uh, I got my orders to go to uh, San Diego to join my first air group, uh, <clears throat> our, our, our uh, plane crew. When I got to San Diego, uh, my plane crew was in the process of farming, and after the first week, all the crew was there, and uh, our plane was there. Uh, old PB4Y1, which is the B24 Liberator, and uh, had all the cameras installed in the bomb bay, and uh, <clears throat> we uh, <clears throat> did uh, a month of training. Then we got our orders to head overseas. Our squadron was Fleet Air Photo Squadron 1. It was a new naval uh, photo squadron. Uh, Admiral Nimitz uh, ordered the formation of this uh, squadron. The Navy had never had one before. And so uh, we, uh, they formed the uh, this Fleet Air Photo Squadron 1. It was based on Guadalcanal. And they had already been out there a year. And my, my, my ground, my uh, plane and our, uh, uh, our crew was a replacement crew for uh, one of the planes in, in the squadron that had been shot down. In fact, they lost two planes. There's an eight plane squadron and two of them were, were lost. And uh, so we went out as a replacement of one of those uh, plane crews that went down. But out of the two planes that went down, only one man was lost. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, PBYs came in and picked up the, the, the crews that went down. And the first plane that went down, uh, PBY came in to pick them up, and uh, uh, the, it was a real windy day and had pretty high waves. Anyhow, that PBY got, uh, with a heavy wind, got turned sideways to the, to the wave, and boy, the big wave hit him and flipped him over. So now he was down, and all, his, his, all that crew was in the water. So they had to order in a second PBY, and they came in, made a safe landing, and picked up <laughs> all the uh, Fleet Air Photo Squadron 1 guys and the PBY crew. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> the uh, next plane that went down, uh, a PBY picked up all but three of the guys, and three of them drifted away, and uh, so a submarine came up and picked up the other three guys. So PBY picked up part and the submarine picked up part. And finally, they all got back to the base, uh, but uh, the planes were lost, so, uh, and uh, of the ones that went down, the one guy disappeared, and there were three or four of them that were injured pretty bad. So uh, we replaced that plane where they lost most of the, the people. And uh, so they'd already been out there a year and had done a lot of work and made uh, quite a few invasion maps uh, like Bougainville and uh, 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 they had just started on doing uh, a Guam, Saipan and Tinian. <clears throat> so well, explain how you did the maps. Okay, well, yeah, the, uh, what you do when you're making a mosaic map, try to uh, uh, do your mosaic map about two weeks prior to the invasion of an island. So, uh, like on Guam, South and Tinian, it's, it's a long flight from Guadalcanal to Guam. So, we had to uh, fly from... Uh, from Guadalcanal to Kwajalein and stay overnight, refuel in Kwajalein, and then fly to Guam, Saipan, and Tinian. And you'd take uh, the island below you, you'd 
take four planes or five planes, depending on the width of the island. But Guam was the widest, and really four planes uh, would come in and spread out uh, so many miles apart and fly straight and level over the island at 20,000 feet. And with your cameras going and the, the photographs overlapping each other, the plane over here would overlap this plane's uh, a row of photographs. This guy's would overlap uh, about 40%. Uh, so uh, you got these two, say two planes going here. This, these, these photographs were overlapping these by 40%. And in each photograph, when the camera went off, each photograph overlapped each, each other by 40%. So when you got back, you develop all those rows of film and you had four planes out there, all cameras, I mean the photographs all overlapping each other. You take them and you paste them down on a big board and uh, you have a, then a complete picture of the island. So four planes did Guam, two did uh, uh, Tinian and Saipan. And uh, then they stopped at Bougainville coming back and then back to uh, Guadalcanal. During the time, the fleet was out there bombarding uh, Guam, Saipan, Tinian, and uh, uh, a couple of carriers out there uh, keeping, the, keeping the zeros away from our, our, our planes. And uh, so it wasn't a problem, you know, there. And one of the interesting things on Bougainville, when we took Bougainville, the uh, commanding general, the marine general there, they took, they made the landing, and they took about half the island. But Bougainville was so thick with uh, jungle that they couldn't find the enemy they were out there. They, you know, uh, half, we had half the island, the Japs had half. But they tried to do some re reconnaissance, and they, couldn't find just where all the Japs were, so he asked our our squadron to come in and fly over the the Jap area of the island where they were occupied. And uh, sure enough, uh, our color film and would show their camouflage uh, equipment, and uh, and our our film uh, showed where most of them were, most of the Japs were where their heavy equipment was, where their storage, all the ammo storages were. <clears throat> and we'd come in, we'd do that. <clears throat> we'd fly back, develop the film, and fly back to Bougainville and fly over the American occupied part and parachute the pictures down to the, to the commanding general there. <laughs> so that was a big help. And that's one and only time we did that kind of mission. And uh, did you get any resistance when you did that? Only some in aircraft fire. There were no zeros left there. <clears throat> that <clears throat> we've gotten rid of all the all the zeros and uh, fighter planes. And uh, but our worst flight was uh, <clears throat> we flew to. Uh, to New Guinea. <clears throat> From New Guinea, we they wanted us to map Palau Islands, and really it turned out that they really didn't need to invade Palau, but uh, uh, MacArthur thought they needed to, and and uh, Admiral King thought it was necessary to uh, take Palau, but it was a costly invasion. Uh, my brother John I was wounded on the landing uh, at uh, uh, Palau. His buddies, one on the right of him, right on the left of him, were killed, and Johnny's leg was shot up. And he, in fact, his boot was shot off of his foot. But he got up and continued and uh, went through the whole invasion of Palau, and. Before that, he was uh, he was wounded on New Guinea, 
Johnny was one of the first uh, uh, guys drafted out of Beaumont. He and one of our neighbors, and he and our neighbor went to uh, 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 Fort, I can't say the name of the fort now, up near Seattle, and they joined the uh, uh, the Montana uh, National Guard had been called up. So they were put with the Montana National Guard and shipped over to New Guinea before, you know, the early, early part of the war. And uh, he was wounded pretty badly um, on New Guinea and had some pretty tough experiences there. But anyhow, uh, in fact, he was wounded three times. The last time was on Palu, the Palu landed. <clears throat> and for us to be able to fly from New Guinea to Palu to do the mapping, uh, the pre-invasion uh, reconnaissance, uh, we had to have an air base where we could, you know, fly where, where we had the proper amount of fuel that would take us from New Guinea to Palu and back, which was a... It was a pretty long flight, and uh, it, uh, if, if you anything extra on that flight, you could run out of fuel pretty quick, which we almost did. But anyhow, uh, to get that little air base, there's a little island of Wakdi, W-A-K-D-E, Wakdi, and it's right off the northern coast of New Guinea, and the Japs held it. So to get it, John I and his uh, company uh, invaded the uh, eastern end of New Guinea and they went by ship to uh, the little island of Wakdi and they invaded Wakdi. Wakdi was just a very small island. It was only uh, about in length, it was only about two miles long and about a mile wide. So just one airstrip on it, right down the middle. And so Johnny and his company invaded Wakti and took it from the Jats. But to hold it, it was so close to the uh, coast of uh, northern New Guinea that the Japs could, la could lob their heavy artillery over on the island. You know, and if you land a plane there, they'd just start lobbing their heavy artillery over there and uh, knock out any planes that landed there. So uh, after they took the island, they invaded the coast, which was just a mile and a quarter from the uh, northern, from the coast of New Guinea. So Johnny and his guys went over and invaded that area of New Guinea and they just put a, a semicircle around but it's like I said, it's a mile and a quarter away. So they just pushed the Japs back, you know, and destroyed all the artillery they had, the heavy artillery they had there. And uh, <clears throat> they held that perimeter out there, keeping the Japs back so they couldn't attack our air base. So then we landed on Wakdi. Uh, we flew from Guadalcanal to uh, uh, the Admiralty Islands. On that flight, uh, Bob Hope and his crew had been in, on Guadalcanal entertaining us, all the guys on Guadalcanal, and, the, and they had two planes that hauled around that USO show. So there were still some, you know, Japanese uh, fighters and around at that time off of some of the bypassed islands. So we escorted Bob Hope and his, uh, his bunch over to the Admiralty Islands. So we got to see Bob Hope on the one night, uh, I mean one day on Guadalcanal, and the next day we saw him, we flew in there with him, es escorted him to the Admiralties, so we flew in there and we got to see the show again, <laughs> which was a real treat. And we did have some B-25s that, that joined us after we took off and got up near uh, Bougainville on the way to the Admiralties, which was farther northwest, these uh, B-25s 
uh, escorted all of us for ways. And then as we got closer to Admiralties, some B-25s there came up, came halfway out and picked us up and took us all the way into the Admiralties. And then from Admiralties to Wakti wasn't a long flight. So the next day we flew into Wakti to uh, do our flight over Palu. And uh, that was a bad flight. Uh, the worst one we had while I was there, uh, while we were in the South Pacific, uh, got shot up bad and we got, uh, my plane didn't get hit. The other, three of the other planes, there's four of us, and two of the other planes got hit pretty bad. And that's where this, I got this real pretty photograph of this Jap fighter that was making a run, making a run, and he peeled off, and you know, when they come up alongside of you, they pull up alongside and turn it on you and start firing on you. As you're going forward, they pull around to the tail, and then they drop down and come under you. And just as he came under, uh, the camera went off. That Jap was sitting in that zero, with, uh, which was camouflaged of silver gray and had the uh, uh, bright orange rising sun on each wing. And it was really a beautiful photograph. But Admiral Halsey came by our Guadalcanal. He came by and saw that uh, photograph, which the photo interpretation officers had taken that photograph and put it in a light box because it, it was a transparent color film. And they had put a light behind it, and it was a beautiful shot. And uh, uh, Halsey said he wanted it, so he took it. <laughs> but Halsey, everybody loved Halsey. But anyhow, on our way back, uh, we lost all of our uh, directional and uh, uh, finders and radar and everything. And we got, during the battle, we got separated from the other planes. So we were coming back and we were lost. So we sent out an SOS and one of the Aussie shore watchers on northern New Guinea picked up our SOS and uh, directed us towards where he was. And then he contacted Wakti and told Wakti where we were. And Wakti sent out a PBY to pick us up. And, and sure enough, uh, after a while, we could pick up the PBY coming towards us, and he told us where he was, and we joined him, and then he led us in to walk back to Wakti. We had 20 minutes of gas left when we landed, and that shore patrol, that Aussie uh, shore watcher, told us the last contact was, he said, well, guys, I'm glad I could help you. He said, i got to pack up now. He said, i got four natives with me. We have to pick up move because every time I make a contact, the Japs have a fix on where we are and they come after us. So every time we uh, have a fix and uh, have a contact, we have to move. He said, we got to pack up real quick and get out of here. <laughs> and that, we often wondered what happened to that guy, you know. But anyhow, we landed and uh, uh, there were the wounded guys and all the planes are, that we had couple of nurses there, a couple of doctors, and they uh, were working on our wounded guys. And one of them had been, uh, had been scalped. Uh, the, turret, uh, the tail gunner had been scalped with some flying plexiglass. And so when we landed, I got out and went over there, and the nurse was sitting there picking the plexiglass out of the head of this uh, tail gunner. And she just handed me the tweezers. She said, you, you don't have anything to do. She said, you do this. <laughs> so I sat there for two hours picking uh, plexiglass out of the head of this tail gunner. Uh, after uh, that uh, deal, we received orders to come back to the States to get new airplanes and new crew members. And... Uh, we, we needed it badly because the old B-24s we had, uh, PB-4I1s were the original, some of the original uh, models 
And uh, they, they gave us these older type planes to start with because we weren't bombers, we were photo planes, and they didn't think we needed the, the latest version, you know. But anyhow, when we got back to the States, uh, we, we couldn't fly, fly our planes because, uh, well, we had two planes that were able to fly back to the States. So the skipper of the squadron took our plane because we were the latest one to join the, uh, the squadron. The skipper flew back in our plane and the other, one of the other senior officers uh, got the other plane and flew back. But the majority of the uh, squadron, all uh, the plane crews and the ground crew, see there's a couple, 250 some guys in the ground crew. All the uh, photographers have developed the film, printed the pictures and the photo inter inter uh, interpretation officers. So we just had to hitchhike back to the States and on Guadalcanal, this old uh, troop carrier came in one day, and uh, our, uh, one of our officers went aboard, talked to the skipper, he said, we, we, we need a ride back to the States. And the guy on the ships, the skipper of the ship said, well, this old troop carrier is in pretty bad shape. But he said, if you want to come aboard, he said, I, we don't have much food left. And he, we said, well, we'd bring what food we had aboard. And, so we went aboard and took off <clears throat> that old troop carrier. And really, after a few days, all we had to eat was Spam, uh, canned uh, fruit cocktail, and rice. And the rice was full of weev weevils. Mm -hmm. Well, we did have for a while some uh, powdered uh, milk and uh, some kind of eggs. I forgot what they were. They but anyhow, about halfway to Honolulu, the ship uh, uh, ballers went out, so we bobbed around out there in the middle of the Pacific uh, for two days, unable to move. We were perfect target for an old submarine torpedo, you know, but fortunately none of them came by, and so they got one of the ballers working, and we took us, I forgot how many days, to get uh, back into Honolulu. We radioed our, our senior officer with us, uh, radioed to Honolulu and said, told what our condition was, and we were hungry. So when we docked in Honolulu, there was a band there and food galore. I mean, they had tables set up, just all kind of food. <laughs> so the, the ship's crew and all of us jumped off of that ship, and did we, we ate for <laughs> several hours. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so then they repaired the old ship and uh, uh, both boilers working and so they said it would get back to the States okay so we took off uh, the second no the third day we left and we came went into uh, San Francisco and uh, real foggy day Could, couldn't see your hand before in front of your face hardly and uh, almost had a collision with another ship, and anyhow we went and finally got in, just barely moving along at probably two knots, and uh, we docked, and then they, we, uh, uh, the Navy part of it, we went, uh, we, we went into the naval base there, and, and uh, so they could cut our orders to go home on leave and to, uh, uh, and get our orders to report back to San Diego for our new squadron. And while we were there, we were there two weeks and came back to San Diego and in Kearney Field in San Diego, we had our eight new aircraft there waiting for us. And uh, about, we replaced about half of the crew members. And then uh, <clears throat> the ground crew and all the ground photographers and everything uh, got aboard a ship and headed for Guam because by then they were just finished the invasion of Guam and securing it. And uh, so, well, first they, they didn't go to Guam. They went to Honolulu first. And we went through just a couple of weeks of training uh, on our, with our new planes and new, uh, the new uh, uh, crew members, 
And then uh, we went to Honolulu for several weeks and did some advanced training. And our uh, and, and when we but we spent a week there with our ground crew, and then our ground crew took off on, on a carrier and went to uh, Guam. So they'd be ready when we got to uh, uh, got to Guam. What year was that? Uh, that that's in '44. Because see, '43 went to South Pacific. '44 is when we got to Guam in the Northern Pacific. Where were you when you had that? That you had to dig the. Um... <laughs> Bomb shelter? Yeah. <laughs> the fox holes? The fox holes. Where uh, were you when you did that? That was Okinawa. Oh, was. <clears throat> mm -hmm. okay. uh, so we got to Guam and uh, the, the CBs were building our base for us. And boy, they had it up in a hurry. We had Quonson huts for all our photographer, ground crew photographers, and uh, for the photo interpretation officers and in fact, the photo interpretation group was a separate squadron uh, from us. Uh, we were still Fleet Air Photo 1, and they were Fleet Air Photo 2, but we worked together. And uh, when we'd land, they would come pick up our film, develop it, and everything. And that's when uh, I ran into an old friend from Beaumont, Rolf Christopher. He was one of the ground crew photographers. And uh, so we spent a lot of time together. But as you see, shortly after we got to Guam, they had the invasion of Okinawa and the invasion, invasion of uh, uh, Iwo. And uh, so my first flight out of Guam, well, first flight, we've, we did one of some of the bypassed islands like truck. We'd send a crew, a photo crew over a truck at least twice a week, sometimes three times a week, because that was a heavily fortified uh, island that the Japs were holding, and there was a lot of activity going in, going uh, in and out of truck. So we, we'd fly, send one of our eight planes up there uh, like the, three times a week. Then we did other bypassed islands, kept track on them, and the longest flight was a little uh, was to Marcus Island, which is way north, and it was a warning, uh, a small island that Japs had, with two airstrips on it, and that island had a lot of radar, and it was to warn Japan when any of the American fleets were coming from the east into Japan, so we kept track. We've sent a plane over Marcus at least twice a week. And that was a 12-hour flight. It was a long one, very boring. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, what my next flight was over Marcus. And then we were ordered to go to Okinawa. Uh, Okinawa had just started the invasion, and Naha Air Base there, uh, they had just secured it. So we flew in there and were the first heavy type aircraft to land uh, on, uh, on that island. And that day when we landed, the Marines came up and said, <clears throat> with some Jeeps and picked up our gear and everything and, and took us over to where they had some tents set up for us off, the, off of the flight line. And uh, <clears throat> the Marines said, okay guys, they gave us some shovels and they said, uh, uh, start digging your foxholes. We said, man, we're tired. It was late in the evening and we hadn't even eaten our K rations or anything. And <laughs> so we sat down, started eating our K rations, and we said, well, we'll, we'll dig our foxholes tomorrow. Well, about two hours later, the Japs started coming in. The 40 millimeter anti aircraft gun was just about 100 yards, 100 feet from us. Boy, that 40 millimeter started firing. And <laughs> debris started coming down from those 40 millimeter shells and <laughs> ripping up our tents. And, and so uh, we, we all ran and jumped in some ditches. And that's the only thing we could find to get down in. 
So as soon as that the Japs left that day, that night, and that aircraft fire stopped, we were out there digging our foxhole. And all of us. There were two crews, uh, two planes from, of us were there. And all the officers and all the men were out there digging foxholes. We did, did dug up a big foxhole for each crew. Then we put found some old wood and some old uh, tree limbs and stuff and put across the top. And uh, the next night, uh, uh, the Japs started coming in and uh, kamikaze type raids on the fleet out there off the coast. Our the air base, no air base was right there on the coast, and they'd fly over us into the ships, and uh, then. And some of them would uh, bomb, try to bomb our airstrip. And we did that 40 millimeter uh, anti aircraft gun right next to our tents, uh, shot down a twin engine Jap Betty. The Betty aircraft had twin engines, and it was one of their major aircraft. Shot him down, and he, he crashed just uh, about 50 feet uh, from our tents. And uh, it was middle of the night. And the next morning, when we got up, walked out of our tent, there was a foot sitting right outside of our tent. Part of the, one of the crew members of that Jap, that Jap Betty. And uh, some other parts were around, but uh, fortunately the Marines had uh, guys that specialized in picking up parts, you know, so we didn't have to do that, fortunately. And so then we, uh, the next day we started flying. Uh, we took off by ourselves. The two planes took off by ourselves, headed for Kyushu, the southern island of the main island of Japan. And we didn't know what we were going to, you know, what was going to, what we would run into. Uh, see, our, our mission was uh, to start doing photo intelligence of the southern island of, of Japan called Kyushu. And uh, it was for the, uh, the, it, the Operation Olympic. Olympic was the, going to be the invasion uh, of, of the southern islands. And uh, Cornet was, uh, we worked on Cornet flying out of Iwo, uh, Iwo. Uh, and that was for the Tokyo Bay Area and for Tokyo and uh, Honshu Island. And, uh, but that was a few weeks later we worked on Carnet. But Olympic was a, the assignment for uh, our flights out of uh, Okinawa. And, of course, uh, the Japanese expected that. They expected the first uh, landings to be on the southern islands because... That was the most industrialized, one of the biggest industrialized area of Japan. And uh, that's where they had all the uh, caves and under every uh, building in Japan, they had some kind of a factory going under homes, under churches, under uh, everything. They had hidden uh, manufacturing uh, places for producing parts for airplanes and producing guns and ammunition and whatever. Everything for the war venture because they were really preparing for our invasion. But anyhow, our first flight out of Okinawa to go to Kyushu, we attempted it by with no uh, fighter escort. And that was a mistake. We got up there and we got to Kyushu and we got over the most southern part of Kyushu, and we turned, we came in on the west side, made a 90 degree turn, go ahead and due east, you know, with our cameras going, and boy, all of a sudden, zeros came out everywhere, and anti-aircraft fire got heavy, and so uh, uh, the pilot said, uh, to, to, to me and to my other, to other photographer on board says, cut off your cameras and get in the, uh, man the uh, machine guns in the waist hatch. You know, machine your, 
uh, man your station. So uh, we turned off the cameras and uh, uh, jumped back in the uh, waste hatch and manned our uh, 50 millimeters. And but our the pilot did a great job uh, in getting out of the uh, flak fields, the anti-aircraft fire, and the Japs didn't the plane the zeros didn't stay on us. They just made a couple of passes and they left because there were some B twenty uh, fives coming in from uh, uh, Okinawa, and uh, they were after them. They saw that we were not fighters. So we were. We were just a photo plane, so they they were going after uh, the B-25s, and also uh, some of the Third Fleet was in there at the time, and uh, they were sending some uh, Corsairs and Bearcats and uh, planes off of the carrier in there, so the Zeros left us and went after them. But we had a lot of anti-aircraft fire, so uh, our pilot was a great pilot. He'd see the anti-aircraft fire coming up. He'd stall the old B-24, just like it would sit there and shake, <laughs> like it was about to come apart, and then he'd dive down. Anyhow, we got out of Kyushu without getting hit that day, and we got on back to, uh, to Okinawa, <clears throat> but there were two Zeros following us, but uh, uh, some fighters up from the Third Fleet came up and got them, knocked them down before they, they could do anything to us. And so we got back to Okinawa. And so the next day, well, we, well for, uh, that night we had a briefing uh, with the Air Force and uh, uh, we told them what we had run into. And they had just arrived over, over on Ie Shima. That's an island just uh, west of Okinawa. Uh, a, a big flight of uh, P-51s. The P-51s, that were the, they were the first ones to arrive there. <clears throat> so they said, well, we're going to start going flying over Kyushu and strafing and so forth. They said, we'll go with you. So the next day, uh, we took off and, and headed for Kyushu. And when we got halfway there, looked out the window and there was P-51s everywhere. There were 80, 85 or 86 of them all around us. We, but keep in mind there were two of us, two planes, our mm -hmm. plane and another photo plane. And uh, <clears throat> so we had about 85 fighters with us. So we did the same thing. We flew up the, on the west side, 90 degree turn, and headed across Kyushu. And, uh, uh, and so with all those P-51s there, the zeros really came up. In fact, they saw us coming and they were up uh, uh, above 20, we were at 20,000 feet and they were probably at 25. And uh, so they started coming down really after the P-51s. And uh, a couple of them made runs on us. And uh, uh, I was there and after we found out we could not make a photo run, we turned off the cameras, got back in the waste hatch again, and I was looking out the waste hatch, and a, a, a zero came by, and everybody in the plane was firing at him, and all of a sudden, what? He just burst into flames. That plane just disintegrated, and we all said, "Oh boy, we got him!" But then we looked, then we saw coming right after he burst into flames, three P fifty ones was still firing at him, but they came by. We said, well, maybe we didn't get him. <laughs> I think maybe the P-51s got him. Well, there, uh, you know, they, they had uh, uh, 50 millimeters and they had uh, a couple of 20, mil 20 millimeters and they had a lot of firepower. So we were successful in getting out of the uh, anti-aircraft uh, flak fields and headed back to um, uh, Okinawa and uh, while we were on Okinawa that two weeks, every night we'd have uh, uh, kamikazes coming in and uh, uh, make, primarily making a run over our airfield to the bay where the ships were uh, anchored. And you know, they did a lot of damage. Every night we were 
uh, we'd have to spend some time down in our big foxhole that we had, uh, that I told you about earlier. And uh, you know, those big old 40 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft guns were right near our tent, firing away. And, uh, <clears throat> and they knocked down uh, quite a few of the night, Japanese night raiders, but the kamikazes were coming in very, very low. Uh, in fact, one day we were out uh, working on our plane, uh, uh, refueling and uh, putting in new film in the cameras and doing the regular things, rearming the, the 50 millimeter, uh, 50 caliber machine guns. And uh, I just jumped out of the plane and I looked down the, the uh, uh, runway and here came a Jap Zero. He wasn't 20 feet off the ground. So all of us that were out of our planes, uh, all I had was a, a 38. I carried a 38 with me. Most of the guys had 45s. And the Marines ran up there with their rifles. And everybody was firing at that, that uh, Japanese coming right up right across, right down our airstrip. And sure enough, the, he was hit and he crashed at the end of the uh, uh, runway. But a few minutes later, here came another one. And uh, we were not really pre prepared for him, so we didn't get to shoot at him. But I could see that pilot sitting there, holding his joystick and looking straight ahead, you know, with that zero. And he went over, uh, the airfield and, and, and hit a, uh, one of our tankers sitting out there in, in the bay. You know, they, they uh, uh, hit, uh, what, 100, almost 200 ships off Okinawa were hit by kamikaze planes and created a lot of damage, destroyed a lot of our shipping and, of course, uh, a lot of our uh, uh, sailors Marines and sailors on the ships uh, were, were killed. And uh, at <clears throat> night, the fighting was very furious, furious. And it was just a few miles from where our airfield was. And so at night, the battleships and the heavy cruisers would all night long would fire star shells. A star shell is a phosphorus shell that explodes, you know, up. 10 or 15,000 feet, or and some of them only uh, four or 5,000 feet. And that kept the front lines uh, lighted. It was, uh, uh, the purpose was to keep the, uh, everything lighted over there on the front lines so the Marines could see uh, what the Japs were doing, what, how they were moving during the night. And it was like uh, 4th of July fireworks all night long for the uh, two weeks that we were there. But uh, we kept, uh, we, we, about every other day, we would uh, take off and if, if, if we couldn't make it to, uh, and also with fighter, pilot, uh, fighter planes, the P-51s, one day we had 90 P-51s with us, or 92. And uh, we were successful in doing photo reconnaissance uh, over the many islands that were south of uh, Kyushu and west of Kyushu, because anti-aircraft fire wasn't near as heavy there as it was over the main island, uh, over Kyushu, the big island. <clears throat> so we did have some, some successful photo runs, but the runs that we were trying to get over the highly industrial area of Kyushu Finally, uh, uh, they, they had equipped already on some of the carriers uh, some Bearcats uh, with a camera mounted in the nose of the fighter plane. So, uh, and there were a couple of P-51s that were equipped with, uh, with cameras. So they took over uh, some of the Navy planes and some of the Air Force planes took over uh, photograph in that highly industrial area where the uh, anti-aircraft fire was so heavy. And because I knew it, us flying at slow, OB-24 flying at, uh, at our speed, a couple hundred miles an hour, 
uh, at 20,000 feet straight and level was just a target for uh, the anti-aircraft fire and the zeros. So uh, they dismissed us from doing, uh, making those runs. <clears throat> But we did were successful in doing the other smaller islands. Then after two weeks there, we went back to Guam for a little rest. And uh, what happens? There are eight planes in a squadron. We kept two on Okinawa, two on Iwo Jima, and the other four uh, on Guam. And uh, while you're on Guam. You were still flying at least every other day over bypassed islands. Anyhow, there were quite a few islands that were still occupied by the Japs, and we had to keep contact over them. And uh, like the island of Marcus. Marcus was a small island uh, several hundred miles east of Japan, which was kind of an outpost, and they kept track on the movement of the American fleet. And uh, so we flew up there. One of our planes would go up there about every third day. To, and it was a long flight. It was a 12-hour flight from Guam up to Marcus and back. A very boring flight. And we'd get up there, and there was just that one small island, and we'd fly around it uh, uh, and fly over it, make one pass over. We'd go out, and then we'd drop down and come back and shoot oblique uh, cameras out the waste hatch just to see what they were doing, what uh, ships were coming and going over there, out of there, and uh, just, a, uh, just a reconnaissance just to keep that island under surveillance. And then the truck. The truck was the biggest uh, of our trips uh, out of Guam. We sent a plane to truck every two days. And because uh, Truck was one of their main uh, fortified islands, and beautiful islands uh, in that group of around Truck. And uh, so uh, one of the four planes would be every few days go to Marcus, and uh, like every couple of days we'd go over to Truck. And the thing about Truck was that the, they had some of the best. Uh, uh, and aircraft fire uh, people that we ever run run into, and we would uh, they would <laughs> their uh, anti aircraft fire was very accurate. So uh, uh, most of our planes got would get a little flack uh, flying over a truck, but uh, of course there were no planes, there were no zeros, so we'd have to worry about that. But so often we'd fly up there, and we'd find a little convoy of jet. Uh, uh, sand, big sand pans and small tankers and such going into truck to resupply them. And when we would catch those, uh, uh, spot those uh, little convoys, we'd radio back to Guam and the B-25s would come out and uh, usually uh, destroy everything in those small, small convoys. Those B-25s were those guys were excellent. It's quite a sight to see them come in low and with their uh, all their 50 millimeters and their they had also a 20 millimeter and a, and a, it, I forgot the, the oh yeah a 40 millimeter cannon was finally put in the nose of some of those uh, B25s, but those 20s were enough to do a lot of damage to those those uh, large sand pans and small tankers. So we were on back at Guam for two weeks and we got orders to go to Iwo Jima. So we went to Iwo and uh, we didn't have any fighter escort uh, with us flying over the Tokyo and Tokyo Bay area. Uh, but we synchronized our raids with the B-29s of course, the B-29s would come, out, come off of Guam, Saipan, and Tinian. And uh, we would take off before the B-29s got to Iwo, flying over. And we, they would 
we we was much slower than the B-29, so about the, just before we'd get to Japan, the B-29s would be coming coming over us. They flew higher than our 20,000 feet, and uh, while they then they'd go in and do their bombing, fire bombing, and very you know did a lot of damage to Kai to uh, Tokyo Bay area, uh, and uh, then we'd come in behind them. And uh, we would, at that time, we were preparing for the Coronet invasion, uh, which was going to be in March of 1945. Uh, the, the one over the Olympic invasion was going to be in, let's see, uh, I think it was the first part of October of uh, 44. That's right, 44. And then, uh, about five, four months later, they were going to start the invasion up around the Tokyo Bay area. So we were mapping the the coastline, east coastline of Japan, uh, the, uh, the Tokyo Bay area, uh, where the main force was going to go into land. And the Japanese had their uh, first army division uh, there. And we kept track of uh, how the first, their first army division, uh, or, you know, built up their armory, and we could spot uh, tanks and stuff, and and uh, troops. How the troops were building up there, and it was going to be a terrible landing if we ever had to land there. Uh, they predicted, you know, we would lose a, a million of our. Uh, Army, Navy, Marines uh, on that invasion. And uh, a lot of people don't know it, but the Japanese even uh, closed their schools uh, about that time and they started teaching their kids how to, how to fight and how to, uh, how to uh, uh, ward off uh, our invasion. And women, women were equipped with uh, it's, uh, bamboo spears or whatever, and it, it was going to be a terrible landing. And uh, so don't let anybody tell you that we were wrong by dropping the, the atomic bomb. Uh, if we had had to invade, uh, like I say, we'd have lost a million, and they would have lost probably about three million, two to three million. So the atomic bomb was was a godsend. It was absolutely necessary. We never did get a zero after us in the Tokyo Bay area because they what few uh, Japs uh, planes that they were uh, willing to sacrifice were after the B-29s. But uh, after a few weeks, uh, the B-29s didn't even re receive any. Uh, uh, interception by the zeros. They they were holding back what number they could for the invasion. They knew the invasion was coming, so they were holding their best planes and their best pilots back for the big invasion. So the Jap the B-29s and uh, our work, we got very little interference, just anti-aircraft fire, that's all. You know, and the reason why they took Iwo is because the B-29s that were uh, hit by an early part by the Zeros and then by anti-aircraft fire had to have a place to come in uh, because they couldn't make it back to Guam and Saipan. So Iwo uh, received a lot of B-29s that had been damaged and uh, landed uh, their own Iwo while we were there. Also, uh, my first trip to Iwo, uh, one of my best friends, Dale Broussard, uh, we went to, we were just, you know, and when we were kids, we were good friends. And he went into the Marines by the time I went into the Navy. And uh, he made the uh, Iwo invasion. And uh, um, that while I was there on the first trip, I started looking around the cemetery uh, on the white crosses 
and I found Dale Broussard's cross. So I took some photographs of his cross and uh, and some and a lot of pictures of Ewo and made up a little booklet. And uh, I brought it back to uh, Dale Broussard Sr., Dale's father and his mother, and uh, showed a lot of pictures of, of, of his grave and why we had to take Ewo, showing B-29s crashed and P-51s uh, flying and, uh, uh, and uh, oh, about, uh, I guess, 15 years ago. Uh, of course, Mr. and Mrs. Dale Broussard are long gone now, but I ran into one of their grandsons and met, met him, and he said, Jack Perrier, he said, you know, uh, I found a booklet on Iwo Jima in my grandfather's files, and he says, it's on my desk. He said, I, just two days ago, I found that book, and it's sitting on my desk right now. <laughs> so I told him the history of the little book, uh, and it was quite, quite a coincidence and quite inter inter interesting. But uh, uh, we worked on Iwo for two weeks, and uh, I worked out of Iwo over the... the, the bunch of flights over, we, we were actually doing some in northern Kyushu, southern Oahu, uh, not Oahu, what do you get to? anyhow, the, the main island, and uh, we uh, synchronized in the raids with the B-29s and the decrease in the number of zeros, we really didn't have any problem flying out of Iwo. Uh, so, uh, after two weeks, we were sent back to Guam, and uh, <clears throat> but when they dropped that bomb, everybody said, well, this is it. This is going to be the end of the war. Three days, you know, went by, and uh, Truman, President Truman, gave the Emperor of Japan three days to surrender. Well, he didn't surrender. So the fourth uh, day came along, and... Uh, uh, we were sent back uh, to Iwo, myself and another plane, because the crews that were up there uh, were junior crews or, and didn't have the experience that our crew and the, the, the Lieutenant Campbell's crew had, so they sent us back to Iwo. Uh, to our, our, our assignment was when they do surrender, we were to take off and do the uh, reconnaissance over the new, uh, about six bay areas where uh, the uh, third fleet, the fifth fleet, and the seventh fleet would be pulling in <clears throat> to uh, Japan. Because, you know, there were sunken ships in those bays, or uh, 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 all kind of defenses in those bays. So our color film and our regular black and white film would uh, pick up a lot of that underwater stuff that we're in those bays. So that was our assignment once they surrendered. So we were up on Iwo when the second, well, uh, the second bomb was dropped while we were still on Guam. Then we were sent to Iwo to relieve the two crews that were there, two plane crews that were there. So after the second bomb, we said, well, for sure they're going to surrender now. So, if, you, if what few people know, uh, there was a Japanese major that had planned a coup of uh, in Japan, and he actually got enough military officers together to uh, go into the emperor's compound, which was you know used, was against the law for anybody to go in that compound unless they were invited. He went into the compound and took the emperor prisoner. And he said, we're not going to surrender. We're going to fight to the end. And uh, so uh, for uh, four days, Truman kept waiting for, or three days, kept waiting for the emperor to surrender. And he'd gotten word that the emperor, emperor wanted to surrender. But he didn't. Couldn't figure out why. But the reason why he didn't surrender he was being held captive by 
uh, these uh, by this coup. And uh, so uh, finally, the fourth day, Truman came back and said, okay, guys, the third fleet, the fifth fleet, the seventh fleet, you take off uh, this morning and you hit Japan with everything you got. So there were over a thousand American military aircraft flying over Japan all day long that fourth day. And B-29s were also in the air. And, uh, uh, and still no surrender. So that night, a friend of ours who lives at Corinthia uh, was a pilot of a B-29 and his, 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 uh, his squadron of B-29s uh, and eight, I think he had in his squadron there's a hundred and something planes. Anyhow, off of Guam, Saipa, and Tinian, that night, 840 B-29s took off and they finally hit all the big major targets like the supply depots and there was one refinery there that uh, we did not bomb. It was the only supply, uh, energy supply for uh, the Japanese and the decision had been made by, by, by MacArthur, stay away from that refinery, let them have, the people need some uh, energy. So we had not bombed this, uh, this uh, target or this big refinery up north of Tokyo uh, during the heat of the war. They had kind of stayed away from it. So anyhow, uh, our friend uh, uh, at Carincia, uh he flew, he dropped the last bomb on Japan. That 840-something B-29s took off that night. They, and we heard them going over even. Uh, the, all those B 29s would go right over Iwo, heading for Japan. And boy, we heard them going over that night. And, uh, and uh, Travis, uh, who's our friend at uh, Corinthia, uh, his plane was ready to take off with his squadron, but he developed a gang sleep. So he had to taxi back. Uh, and, and it took him about uh, 25 minutes, he says to fix the gas leak. The gas leak was fixed, so he taxied back out and took off. And keep in mind, all these B-29s were loaded with, to the maximum. They had, uh, I forgot the tonnage of bombs they had aboard. But anyhow, they took off, and they were, see, 25 minutes behind the rest of the, 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 all the uh, uh, other B-29s. So, they, all the others went in, dropped their bombs, and turned around and started back when Travis's, Travis's plane got over the target. And like I say, he dropped the last bomb because he was the last one uh, over Japan. And, uh, and he headed back, and uh, with all that heavy load that these B-29s had, some of them did get damaged by anti-aircraft fire. Uh, they, quite a few of them had to land on Iwo. So we were there and talking to them about uh, that raid that night. Of course, Travis made it on back to, uh, to Guam, but he has the distinction of driving, dropping the last bomb. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we said, surely they're going to surrender now. So uh, the Japanese major that was, had pulled off this coup in Japan, uh, he went to the commanding general of the first uh, division, which I told you was over on the east, east coast, preparing for the, our invasion on the east coast. And he went to this general, which was the top general uh, in the military in Japan, and uh, uh, asked him to join the coup. And uh, this general told him no, that no, he was a young officer, he had to step down, he had to release the emperor, and Japan was going to surrender 
if the emperor wanted to. So he, uh, uh, the young major, committed Harry Carey, uh, and as did most of his followers. They all uh, uh, committed Harry Carey and shot themselves in the head, or, or took the sword. You know, you heard so much about. Uh, <clears throat> and so then the emperor was free to surrender. He had already uh, uh, recorded the surrender message uh, for the people of Japan to hear and for to, to be sent to, to uh, President Truman. So then uh, uh, he was the, the, uh, uh, the recordings of the surrender were played that day and the message was sent to Washington that they, they would take unconditional surrender. So, <clears throat> uh, our mission was to fly, you know, uh, we, we were supposed to fly the next day to start doing the reconnaissance on the Bay Areas. But MacArthur said no. He said, I don't want anybody over Japan or landing, uh, putting foot on Japan until uh, my troops land. And he said it's going to take three days for us to to get out everything organized to, to land uh, in the Tokyo Bay Area. So, <clears throat> and he told, sent messages that we could leave the day after, uh, we could start our work the day after the first troops land in the Tokyo Bay Area. So, uh, uh, they, uh, the third day, the uh, First troops landed, so the next day we got orders to fly and to start our work. And uh, uh, of course, just uh, the old uh, uh, P uh, the uh, old transport planes, C what C thirty fives, C thirty sevens, were flying the troops in to a uh, Japanese naval air base on the north side of Tokyo Bay. And, and they were coming in one right after the other. So the next morning we took off to go do our work. We got up there and a storm had moved in all along the East Coast and the weather was just terrible. So we couldn't do any uh, reconnaissance under those conditions. So uh, they gave us permission to land at the same uh, air base where MacArthur's troops were coming in. So we landed on that air base and of course, the Japanese planes were, you know, very light. None of their big planes were near as heavy as the old B-24. So we landed on that airstrip, and the, the troops were flying in right, one plane right after the other. They'd come in, unload the troops, take off, and head back to the Philippines and to Okinawa, picking up troops. So we landed right in the middle of all those P-30s, I mean, C C-35s. And when we hit the runway, uh, the pilot said, oh, this runway is soft. And of course, it wasn't, it wasn't built to handle a heavy plane like a B-24. And sure enough, when we got to the end of the runway, we sunk down. And we had to get out, and uh, we found a, a, on that base, the military allowed the Japanese officers to remain on the base to keep it operational. But all the Japanese troops were moved out. So uh, one of the, uh, we got a hold of one of the Japanese uh, officers and he, he saw what had happened. So he brought a tractor up there and hooked onto our plane and pulled us out of that, uh, off of that uh, 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 runway and uh, onto some tarmac, which also we saw that we sunk in that but he kept pulling us around till we found find some a hard spot where our plane could sit because uh, we would have to stay overnight until the weather cleared. So we uh, uh, were prepared. We had uh, we had, uh, some of our, our you know our shave gear and stuff with us. So we got on a plane and this this uh, Japanese officer took us to a barracks. Uh, uh, which was empty now of Japanese, uh, told us where we could uh, sleep. 
on, uh, on this double box with just a bare mattress. And uh, we got in there and uh, uh, we saw some blood on the floor in the back of the, uh, uh, of the uh, barracks. And, and we finally found the story was that the first troops that landed there, of course, put a perimeter around the air base. And during the night, uh, about six Japanese uh, diehards, kamikaze type guys, slipped in between uh, the, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the perimeter guards. But uh, three of them were, were in, the, in the back of the six of them, they got under the fence and, and started running towards the barracks where we were staying. Well, this, this was the night before, night before we got there. And uh, <clears throat> some of the American troops had occupied that same barracks the night before. So anyhow, the, the guys on the perimeter started firing at them, killed three of them, but three of them got into the barracks. And of course, the guys in there had heard the fire, uh, the, uh, uh, the shooting going on, so they got up with their rifles. And when those three guys came running in the back of the barracks, you know, they killed them pretty quick. So, uh, uh, but the night we were there, everything was calm. Uh, none of the Japanese kamikaze guys could get in because they doubled the size of the uh, people on the perimeter to keep that from happening again. And uh, they had just started moving troops uh, from that air base into Japan. Uh, I mean, into uh, Tokyo, uh, where they were going to meet the, uh, the Japanese uh, uh, and the Japanese headquarters, military headquarters. And so the, the next day, we were able to get out of there to take off because the weather, weather had cleared. And uh, uh, they, they took us, the, that tractor pulled us all the way down to the end of the runway. And uh, uh, we had to sit there and gun our engines to full force with our brakes on, and then uh, you know, then with the full 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 power was going on the on the four engines, and so we were able to take off, even though that uh, that runway was pretty soft. And we got up and we did our reconnaissance over Tokyo Bay. And the other plane was doing, uh, went uh, a little f further south on some of the other uh, uh, Bay areas. And then our next, after we did Tokyo Bay area, we went across the island and did a, uh, a uh, reconnaissance of uh, a bay on the west side where the, let's see, that would be third fleet. No, the fifth fleet was going to pull in over there. The Bull Halsey's, Halsey's third fleet was going to pull into the uh, east side of Kyushu, and, the, and, and then Admiral Nimitz's seventh fleet was going to pull in uh, the Tokyo Bay area on the Missouri, as you know. So uh, we, uh, after that first successful day, we went back to Iwo, and what, what, with our film. When we landed, there was a carrier plane there ready to get our film and take it back to Guam to be processed. And then it would be processed in a few hours, and the photo intelligence officers would do their work with it, and that reports would go to the, uh, to the fleet. And some of the photographs would be uh, by a carrier plane would go into the carriers, uh, taking the results of our our uh, photo reconnaissance. And uh, so uh, uh, we, several more days, we, we uh, after the first successful day, went back to Iwo, re, re, got, you know, uh, got all the new film we needed and uh, uh, took off again. And we did several more Bay Areas, come back to Iwo, the carrier plane would take our film 
and back to Iwo, I mean back to Guam. And uh, that went on for about four days. And then that finished our mission. So we flew back to Guam. And uh, fortunately, uh, our planes were still in reasonably good condition, uh, good enough to fly back to the States. Our crew was a senior crew, so we got to, we had enough points. You had to have a certain number of points to, 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 to come on back, or, you know, right after the war. So our crew had enough points and our plane was in good shape. So uh, we were on the first planes to uh, leave Guam and head back to the States. And we flew from Guam to Johnston Island, from Johnston Island to uh, Honolulu, uh, and uh, where we stayed a couple of days and refueled and uh, offloaded all of our ammo. And then uh, after the second day, we flew back to San Diego. And once we reached uh, San Diego, uh, I uh, took about a week before uh, we received our orders uh, and, a, and a voucher to catch a train to go home. But we were not discharged then. They, the orders, you know, given orders to go back to your hometown and within 30 days report to the nearest military base for discharge. So uh, I took the train home and uh, arrived and uh, about a week later uh, I went to a, a military base o over near Houston, one of the old air bases, and was discharged there. So uh, that uh, ended my World War II.